Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name's Jason Carty. My name's Stephen Cockcroft. And we're live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. Today, it's another look back on the 25th anniversary of the Beatles anthology in our season opener this year. We looked at the long and winding road, ho-ho, from 1968, when the project was first mooted, up until 1992, when it suddenly burst into a a real-life thing. And today we're going to look at uh, 1992 up until the air date, and there's still another long and winding road to go in in, in that. Maybe it's a long and a short and winding road from 1992 onwards, Stephen. You're really, you're really working this uh, an, uh, metaphor. Uh, you know, metaphor. Yes, um, yes uh, it, 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 it's taken a long time to get to this point, but we're still some distance from the uh, the finished product by and, May '92. Yeah, and so what we'll kind of look at today is how you know it might have all seemed very planned, but you know there's also a couple of happy accidents that happen along the way. So if we're trying to look at a point, it's May 1992 when Apple announce officially that the band are working on uh, a documentary. Documentary. And it is still called The Long and Winding Road at this point. That's the name they use, isn't it? Yes, I think that's that's the interesting thing at this point. That's still that's still the project name, and that's been around since since the early 70s. And I think if you're a Beatles fan at that point, you know, you'll you'll probably have known that the Long and Winding Road has a has an existence. So for fans at the time who might have read this, it, it would have flagged up to them that, oh my gosh, this is actually happening. Um, and, and probably the first concrete thing that they do are, are the interviews get started pretty much soon afterwards. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, I say this, this is a long period of, of, of working out. Um, they start interviews. Uh, Jules Holland is initially brought in to do the interviews. Mm. Um, so in June 1992, he's on a little tugboat in the Thames with Paul. If you remember that footage yes. of, of Paul in the... Uh, <laughs> um, so all of these interviews will take place over the next two to three years. Almost all of the interviews are done separately so yeah. you, you very rarely in this project uh, do we see all of the three beetles uh together um and also there's a little bit of mix and match where you can see them beards coming and going hair <laughs> getting shorter grayer yes. in, Paul, in paul's case less gray um <laughs> uh, so it's it, it when, when you see the finished product you can see their they, they sort of intercut interviews from different Period. And it would be lovely to get maybe some raw, uncut interview footage. But it, it, it's interesting that even from the start, it, some of this is being done by committee because Jules Holland is an interesting choice. He's, you know, he's he's a he's a friend of musicians, but he's not really David Frost when it comes to interviews. No, I mean, I think it's, you know, with all respect to, to, to Jules, uh, you know, his interviews on his music programs are not the highlight. Yeah. Um, and he doesn't he doesn't last long, to be fair. No, he doesn't. But what I will say in Jules's defense is, you know, he, he, he hosts the show later on, on BBC TV. And is that there's never any um, anxiety in any musician who's sitting down to be interviewed by him on his show. They always no. know it's going to be like, oh, what did you listen to growing up? And uh, yeah. I'm going to do you like Boogie Woogie Piano? Away we go. So yeah. he's yeah. always quite laid back. So, you know, he was obviously a name from a shortlist that seemed to be uh, acceptable to uh, to Paul, George, and Ringo. Yes, and, and this is one of the things that I think we'll, we'll we'll come across as we talk through this project is the acceptability test that has to be passed for each of the three of them. Um, that 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 whoever is involved in this, um, th- there's a lot of compromises uh, involved in putting the team together. Yes, and yes, you you, you do get a sense. Jules Holland was probably. Uh, you know, he's a musician's musician. Yes. Uh, he's, uh, and he was acceptable to all three. And so the, 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 these interviews, when you see the anthology, they have different backdrops. So Paul is on a boat, as you say, at one point, and another one, he's sitting in front of a very impressive stage, like in a yeah. sound check kind of zone. Yeah. Um, Ringo's always sitting behind his shades. George is always in some corner of Friar Park with a moustache, without a moustache, in a jumper. And, yeah. you know... Paul knows how to be interviewed and the others are kind of slightly, the tone is a bit off a little bit. Paul is clearly loving. Loving it. You He's know, loving you know, that he, it's actually happening. Yeah. It's just the fact that it's, that, that, that just comes across in every, uh, every single shot. He's just thrilled 
to finally be doing that. <laughs> and do we know how long Jules lasts? Because is it, is it, who takes over the interviews? Is it Jeff Wanfor who does some of the other interviews? Uh, I think Jeff Wanfor does some. And is it Bob Smeaton, who was yeah. the series director? Is he, in, he involved as well? I think he's he's certainly in the room. Yeah. One of, one, one, of the, one of the things is that you rarely see, you, you never see the interviewer. You can see Jules' head on the boat. Yeah. And yeah. that's about it. Yeah. That, that, that's, you know... Yeah, it's it's very hard to see where they are. You can um, and occasionally you hear Jules Holland laughing in the in the background. So, so the summer of 1992, these interviews are the first kind of concrete thing that come into existence, and uh, they're obviously still just raw footage. By the end of that year, you know we've got to remember that. Paul is still being an active uh, musician. You know, he's he's you know simultaneously finishing and teeing up his. Um, off the ground album and he's going to spend 1993 on the road yeah. um, but there's a big meeting uh, at the end of uh, the year in October at MPL and that's who's that with? Yes well this is this is essentially a business meeting where I think the three of them are there Yeah. Um, and one of the things that comes across as I say is that there's a lot of negotiation hmm. around this uh, not only in getting it set up but as the project moves forward every stage is subject to negotiation hmm. Um you know, they each have their team of lawyers and helpers and PAs and managers and all of this negotiation is, is going on. And so as we go into the end of the year, at the end of the year, Paul says, you know, oh, you know, yes, this is happening. And me and George might do a little bit of music for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and for once, there isn't a, a witty put down or repost from George. George doesn't deny it. No, I mean, George George over the years has always been very quick to point out that, that Paul... Ref- sort of drags up the possibility of Beatles reunions when he has something to sell or where, when he has a tour to promote. Um, this doesn't happen here. I mean, as recently as October that year, yeah. uh, George was still down playing the reunion uh, rumors. And he was asked in an interview about the Beatles getting back together again. He, he famously says, how many Beatles does it take to change a light bulb? Mm-hmm. The answer is the answer's four. <laughs> um, and it's very much this idea where he he's saying, you know, if John Lennon, for so long as John Lennon is still dead, yeah. there's no uh, there's no Beatles. Beatles but, yeah. but then Paul is sort of saying, oh, we're going to get together. We're going to write some music. Now, at this stage, it's Paul seems to be alluding to the fact that he and George are going to write some incidental music. Uh, that's that's what how people interpret that, I think. Yes. And so, you know, as we said, 1993 ends up being a bit of a busy year for Paul. So obviously some of those interviews in front of the stage are on the, the, the Paul yep, World Tour. That, tour. that becomes, you know, Paul is live, you know, uh, uh, off the ground comes out at the start of the year, the Paul is live album comes out at the end of the year. So he's still doing his thing and these interviews are happening in the background and obviously they're starting to, 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 to knock it into shape. Um, but... You know, the question in 93, and I, I find this quite interesting, is that there's still no plan at this point to put out any of the albums or any of the, you know, like we now think of the anthology and we think of the the three double CDs mm. of music that came out at the same time. And in 1993, that wasn't really on the cards. No, that's cert- certainly early 93. That does not seem to be on anybody's radar. Yeah. Um, they're very much focused. This is a, this is a documentary project. Um, you know, there's footage, there's uh, outtakes clearly there, little bits of film and live, but actually dragging all of that out of the vault, looking at it and putting out an album is not on the radar. Um, George Martin gave an interview in 1993 in March, and he actually says there are no usable outtakes. And the direct quote was, it's all junk. <laughs> uh, couldn't possibly release it. So he, he's absolutely downplaying the idea that there's anything. There's going to be no hidden gems coming out of this. Yeah. But what what's happening at the same time is with the rise of CDs hmm. uh, and the ability to sort of uh, press up or record CD, uh, CDs, there is a whole industry ga- sort of gathering pace uh, producing bootleg material. Well, I remember vividly, 92, 93, because I was in college at the time, finding a shop in Dublin that did bootleg CDs. Yeah. Uh, good old record collector on Wicklow Street. Don't look for it, it's not there anymore. But I remember finding uh, bootleg CDs, uh, Unsurpassed Masters were there, the Yellow Dog CDs, and they yeah. were prohibitively expensive. Yes, uh, yes. We- they were about 30 quid each, I think. Uh, yeah, up here they were maybe, and that's in Belfast, we had Hector's house again. Don't look for it, it's not there. Um, but um, yes, the, the, the ultra rare tracks, the Unsurpassed Masters, yeah. I think they were maybe 20, 20 quid, something like that. Uh, so you start to see these and uh, 
you know, you'd have to be blind not to notice that there's a market for this kind of stuff. Yes. I mean, the, 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 there were, you know, the shops that I was going to, the shop that I mentioned, it was full of these. They were always, always described as Italian imports for some <laughs> yes. reason. Um, but they became more and more uh, sophisticated. So, uh, I mean, I remember the one that I most vividly recall and I still have is a collection called Artifacts, which is a long box yeah. uh, of five CDs with very extensive notes. Came out, I think, in, in 1993 and really ran from 1958 to 1970. So it started with um, That'll Be The Day and it finished with the IME Mine session in January 1970. And it was incredibly high quality and it was it was like a documentary in itself. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you would get, you had the Markham and Wise, Moonlit, Moonlight Bay sketch, you had the, uh, the, the, the concert in Sweden, you had outtakes from the Penny Lay and Strawberry Fields sessions, you know, the Isha demos, it was all all there. Yeah, yeah. And so somebody obviously starts to try and put two and two together to realise that there must be some way of doing an official version of getting this music out there. And so towards the end of 93, um, as we said, Paul is on tour and he gets a special visitor at one of his gigs in September. He does, he does. Who uh, goes to see Paul? Well, you know, George goes to see Paul. (laughs) And he jumps up on stage and puts his arms around him. And they have a great night and (laughs) everything. He doesn't do that. (laughs) No, he doesn't do that. He he tells Paul the concert was quite good, but it was too long. (laughs) (sighs) I mean, this is a recurring theme. Uh, You know, why? George, you know. Just be nice. Yeah, because it was too. He probably did biker like an icon or something. Well, he and, probably and, did. Yeah, it wasn't um, wasn't wasn't his best um, well, live j- moment, maybe. But 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 uh, you know, Paul gives a little sort of interview in response to this and comments on this and refers to the fact and said, you know, ah. Oh. I get really angry about this, but, you know, he's my buddy and we've got to kind of, cause he's clearly aware he's got to stay on the right side of George. Everybody has to stay on the page. Yes. And, you know, Paul really wants this to happen. And, yes. you know, he's, you know, he, he, you know, he's pushing over the line. George, as we kind of said in the first anthology episode, you know, he's got a financial reason now that to, to buy in. He's, he's at risk of, you know, losing an awful lot. His yeah. his, his uh, yeah. movie money is, is gone. And so he needs to, you know, bite his tongue, eat humble pie, but he's not making it easy. He's still bristling at some of this stuff that's going on. And uh, so it's it's not as, you know, it, it could have been simple, you know, and if George had jumped up on stage in 93, that would have been a great bit of publicity to, to yeah. get it going, you know, and it just, ah, it's just a pity. Um, it, it's, it, it is funny that, um, you know, as you say, we said, George is probably the most, driven in this to do this for financial reasons yes and you would think if you were that in the hole financially you would be playing the game yes but clearly he knows that no matter how badly he needs this Paul wants it. Yes. Well, uh, and, but he know. has this thing where, and you know, he said this on and off, not just in George, not just to do with anthology, but you know, that he's this kind of self-appointed, um, you know, BS detector because yeah. John is not there. And yes. I think he over eggs that pudding. I don't think John would have done some of the things that George did in that period if he'd been around. You think? I don't, I don't think, I mean, John would have been sardonic and mean and, you know, might have been funny and cutting, but I, I, I think maybe, maybe I'm getting the wrong end of the stick, but I think he would have been a bit more forgiving or a bit more. Uh, gracious. Like, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> am I, am I wrong in saying that there's, it's not, some of it's not very gracious. I, I, I think you can, I think you can get the sense that George resents the fact that he has to do this. Yeah. You know, he's not doing this willingly or voluntarily. He's doing it because he has to. And I think, I think there's a degree of resentment there. That, But Paul is not rubbing his face in it. Paul is, is kind of, you know, well, Paul kind of wants it to be, come on, gang, let's just have a you know, good old time, you know? But yeah, but you can see that's what Paul was doing in, in the in, Let It Be yeah, session. Yeah, that's that's true. What, it's, it's, I think Paul is being Paul. That's yeah. the point. And, and, and you can see, or, or you can get the sense that this is just rubbing George up the wrong way. Well, well yeah. Uh, well, that same month in, in September 93, uh, the Red and Blue compilations come out on CD. And this is significant because it's to do with the settlement that 
Apple made and EMI and the Beatles made with each other at the end of the 80s, start of the 90s. And yeah. the Red and Blue album's coming out on CD on the 20th of September, 93. That's a big deal. It's the first CD release of Beatles material that's not just the main core albums, which came out in 87. Yes. And they're full price, double CDs. They've got the Apple logo on them. So the Apple logo returns. I remember there was big TV ads at the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, even though they the- were just compilations, it was a big deal. It was a big deal because, you, you know, again, this is something we touched on in the compilations episode. These these albums have a sort of iconic status because yeah. so, so many people, this is their uh, entry point. Yeah. You know, from 1973, whenever they first came out, certainly they were albums that I bought very early on. Yes. Um, and, and that kind of skewed my understanding of the Beatles because we've talked before about, you know, Revolver is not represented well. Uh, the White Album is underrepresented. So you get, but these are the entry points. So all of the people that bought them in, in, in 1973 are now buying them again in, yeah. in, on CD. And as you say, full price. Yep. Double double CD, even though people were making the point at the time, you know, drop one track or two tracks, you could squeeze this onto a single well, CD. Red would have fitted onto one CD anyway. Yeah. And Blue could have done it with a one or two tracks dropped. Um, but it's a, it's also a proof of concept. It says, look, mm. the Beatles here and Apple, the new and improved Apple as a, as a Beatles company, can issue material, people will buy it and it will go into the catalogue and it'll chug along. And we're going to come back to uh, another release in, in a second. Um, but that means at the end of 93, um, according to Peter Doggett in his uh, You Never Give Me Your Money book, you know, this is when Paul and George start to realise that actually there is money to be made here and yes. there's a business there's structure in place yeah. for them to be made. And so while the footage is still being put together, you know, Derek Taylor is working on a book and George Martin does start to go off to Abbey Road to see what's in the vaults. What's in the vault, yeah. Yeah. So it, it starts to pick up. So this tips into uh, 1994 and in uh, apparently the 1st of January 1994, who enters the picture? Mrs. Lennon. Mrs. Lennon. Move over, Mrs. L. Uh, Yoko <laughs> enters the room and Paul apparently the now there's there's the legend and then there's yes. the truth <laughs> yes there, there, there's, this is the other thing we have to be very aware of there's a, there's a lot of 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 deliberate myth making you know, yes. you know um and th- th- this is and it is by paul it is by Paul. Yes, he's 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 the master of PR. But yeah. the legend goes that Paul rings up Yoko and says Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> Should old acquaintance be forgot? And all that. And, uh, you know, this is this is where we get uh, the notion that Paul sort of says, hey, is there any, any demos of John's knocking around? It's um, like, it's like, it's like having he, Paul Yeah, here. I know. Um, <laughs> but later in January, Paul inducts John into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and has a yeah. totally normal hanging out interaction with Yoko. Yes, Correct. I mean, uh, yes, you can see this. This clip is on uh, YouTube, uh, Paul giving the speech and, and, and there are photographs and it's the just the most excruciatingly awkward hug. You know, Yoko's <laughs> there dressed in white with this sort of, you know, floppy hat. Paul is kind of very awkwardly you know, hugging and putting his arm. Yeah, it's 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 all staged, and yeah, there's a lot of tension there. <laughs> well, it's you know, January '94. Paul is kind of now in. He he kind of he is tipping over into full tilt anthology mode. And if you if yeah. you think of Paul's '90s, he only puts out two studio albums, proper yeah. studio albums during that time, off the ground and Flaming Pie at either end of the decade. You know, the, he does dedicate himself full tilt to the anthology in the middle. And although he's working on solo stuff in the background and putting flame and pie together um you know he has agreed with emi to kind of park that and yes. focus on getting stuff out in terms of the beatles so he is yeah you know, he's doing the pr thing you know he he is the he's the main cheerleader for this project yeah. i mean he, uh, you know uh, and and almost well one self-appointed but to absolutely by default, you know, George isn't going to do this. Yeah. And Ringo, you, you get the sense that he's there in the background. In, again, d- fulfilling that role that Ringo always seems to to fulfill, which is a sort of stabilizing yeah. influence. You, you know, you, again, we'll come on to this when you see some of the interactions between all three of them yeah. on camera. So they have this Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction and apparently Paul was supposed to be 
in, inducted the following year, and that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Um, that does not which, happen. Which, which kind um, of explains when Paul does get in, uh, inducted, I can't remember which year that was. It was early 2000s, I think. Um, Stella McCartney's wearing a T-shirt that says about effing time on it during, yeah. the, during the ceremony. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, Paul is the, the cheerleader. And so he... This is where we start to learn, i.e. the general public, that he gets the demo tapes from yes. so, Yoko. So, so Paul announces, you know, that the, the three the three Beatles will record together uh, using these demo tapes. Yes. So that, that, that becomes an announcement, but which is odd because there had already been a story in the press um, that the Beatles had recorded together. So Goldmine magazine in, in earlier... Yeah. Uh, had prior to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in, uh, induction, I think, had reported that there'd been a Beatles recording session in August the previous year, which was a complete lie or complete yes. untruth. Um, but then again, people did know that the Long and Winding Road project was a thing. Yes. So, so they, they knew that this was possibly a, a, a you know, a reality. Yeah, on, on the cards. The, the, the two comments that I made a note of are... are Again, the Times, that's the London Times, says the Beatles have had their day. You know, <laughs> they're, they're not overly uh, enthusiastic. And then uh, the font of all musical knowledge, KISS FM, say uh, the Beatles don't mean anything to young people uh, oh, today. That's very sad. And yet here we are, Stephen, two young people with a podcast. Yes, with a podcast. It's amazing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's also nice to know that Yoko was the person who got the Beatles back together. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Pete, <laughs> Pete, Pete Doggett makes the point that, that she recognizes that she is in a position to facilitate this sort of virtual reunion, having for years been, been the one that, uh, you know, was blamed for their breakup. But she also, I mean, the shades of, of George there as well. Um, it, it, but she says, well, after all, John was the band leader, you know, <laughs> so after all, it was my late husband's band. So I should really facilitate that. So again, poor Paul is coming under this pressure from everyone is kind of poking him with a stick. He's just biting you know? his lip. They're like, yeah. now's our chance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so Paul apparently goes to the Dakota the day after the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which must have been strange for him and uh, meets with Yoko and Sean and basically offers her a veto, apparently. Yes. I mean, this, this 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 is fascinating to me. One, that Sean is there. He is part of this. So Yoko is, is kind of bringing him into this. Yeah. Um, and uh, Paul says, you know, I checked it out with Sean because I didn't want him to feel awkward. And Sean says, well, it'll be weird hearing a dead guy <laughs> on vocals, but, you know, give it a try is the direct quote that Paul... Uh, and that, 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 again, that's a peculiar... It seems to me reaction. Yes, uh, to 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 have, but yes, he 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 basically says to to Yoko, or he says he said to Yoko, um, you know, if we don't don't if we don't like it, we won't put it out, put it out. And similarly, he seems to have said, if you don't like it, we won't put it out. Yeah, which was weird, but I don't think that was ever going to be a, a, a reality. Um, and so the demos he gets are uh, Free as a Bird, Grow Old With Me, Real Love, and Now and Then. They're the, yeah. the, she gives him four songs. And what's funny is, and maybe it's not funny because, you know, we pay attention to this stuff. They don't pay attention to it. They didn't really know that these songs were out and in the ether already. It's it, that That is absolutely bizarre mm. um because, like even i when i've heard real love was announced i think in 94 or 95 mm. i was like oh that's the song from the imagine soundtrack in 88 yeah. yes yeah. um and i mean i think it's a different it's a different version of the song it's a that's different the, demo. that's the guitar version but it's still the same tune and but melody still, yeah. It, yeah and uh, grow old with me is on milk and honey mm. uh, so uh, it it is bizarre that they don't know this but again more recently Ringo recorded Grow Old with me and, and he made the point oh I, I never realised that John wrote this song for me yeah uh, I, I'm not in, I, well mm. I don't I don't know I've heard some of those Dakota demos and you can hear John Life Begins at 40 this one's for Ringo uh, nobody told me oh this would be great for Ringo I I, I was never aware of that story so, now the, the, the truth is we talk about Paul's you know burnishing the myth of I rang Yoko up and we buried the hatchet it seems that this goes back to 1991 is it the, 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 the yes. demo idea 
Yes. So, so Yoko again is, is makes it clear that uh, the the people that originally approached her were George and Neil Aspinall. Yeah. And this was this was back in nineteen ninety one. They were floating this idea. And again, if, if you you think about where we got to in the last episode, this is right back at the origins of the project. So, what they had in mind at that time, it's hard to say. But but yes, she makes it very clear. Oh, I just happened to be convenient to hand these over to Paul at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but it was really Neil and George that yeah. initiated. Yeah, that's interesting that Neil, Neil and George are kind of, of running that. Now, George, you know, there's a, there's a similar idea that George was involved in at the time. Now, this is a rumour. This is a, but this, this is, is kind of something I wasn't really aware of until you told me about it. Yeah, this is a rumour that, that's been circulating that um, after... Uh, Roy Orbison passed away in in the Travelling Wilburys. That they, they were looking for a replacement, and certainly I I remember at the time it, you know there was talk about Del Shannon yeah. uh, as as a possible replacement. Ta- uh, um, Roger McGuinn, his name was being mentioned in the music papers, but there is a rumor that George approached the estate of. Elvis Presley and mm. said, you know, would you have a song or would you have something unreleased, a vocal track that we could take um, uh, and work on for use on the on the second uh, Traveling Wilburys album? Now, I have no idea whether this is accurate or not. Uh, you, you see it coming up on the internet from time to time, but it, it, it could very well be just one of those myths that feeds itself. But it does it does seem, you know, interesting, this sort of notion of uh, Aaron Wilbury, you know? And, yeah. and uh, you know, there has been precedent for, you know, even going back to Buddy Holly's posthumous records of people going in and recording on them and, yeah. and turning them into hits, you know? Yes. And I mean, we've been through this with he- with Hendrix. Yeah. Um, and then, you, you know, Nat King Cole recording with his daughter. And, uh, yes, that's right, yeah. Paul was actually asked at one point if he would duet with Elvis on 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 a song um you know posthumously and uh, he said no no uh, you know i think that would be distasteful i don't think that yeah. would be uh you know we didn't sing together when he was alive it's not as if we had a partnership you know and there's two other projects i can remember from the 90s which was in 91 there was a thin lizzie single dedication where which they recorded yeah. over a fill in a backing track and then when 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 anthology eventually comes out it kind of clashes with the queen album made in heaven which is a big yep. posthumous Freddie Mercury album. So yep. this notion of adding, you know, it's not totally new, but the Beatles were obviously trying to marry some very old technology with and some new recording. So um, who who could you call for a situation like that? You you a man of distinction that you wouldn't often find. The man behind no. the shades, behind the shades, behind the shades, behind the shades, behind the beard. And we're talking about say his name, Stephen. Jeff Lynn. Jeff Lynn. I can see you get I can see you getting excited and you're you're shuffling in your seat. Oh, you're getting all excited. Jeff Lynn. Here comes Jeff Lynn to try and solve the the big quandary of how to turn the raw material of John's demo tapes into fantastic. I mean, like who better to make a Beatles record than, who, who, than who, Jeff Lynn himself? Well, He's made so many great Beatles records. Yeah, you want you really wanting me to engage in this conversation with that? <laughs> Yes, uh, you, you know. Uh, yes, yes. I, 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 you know, it could only be. It could only be Jeff Lynn. And the reason it could only be Jeff Lynn is that George said it, it has only, it can only be, be Jeff Lynn. Lynn. Yeah, um, <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, and you know, it's it's a it's a contentious issue because some people are allergic to Jeff Lynn, and some people, some people, some people in the room, well, in the virtual room here. Um, but also, I, I, I personally remember, you know, when he was announced as the producer that, you know, you did think, oh, it's going to sound, you know, it's going to have a bit of that, you know, it's going to come from that same DNA. Yeah, it's going to sound like it was made in 1978. And what's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> not not in a good way, not in a undertones way. No. Um, so, yeah, so Jeff is the de facto producer and like kids in a schoolyard, Paul cho- chooses uh, Jeff Emmerich as engineer. Yes. One each at a time. And Jeff has form, obviously, he's worked with George, he's worked with Ringo. Yes. Uh, Jeff uh, Lynn, this is. Yes. Uh, he'd, he'd worked with Ringo on Time Takes Time in 1992. Um, so supposedly, George, this is an ultimatum. You know, this is an absolute condition mm. uh, that George lays down. And Ringo endorses that. So Paul has to accept that. But as you say, then he goes with Jeff Emmerich. And, you know, he and, he and George don't have the best... Uh, relationship so it is it's this it's this compromise and again you get the sense that Ringo is is 
holding the balance. He's the lukewarm water. He's the lukewarm water, yes. Just doing lots of Spinal Tap references this yeah, week. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but the recording site is interesting that they choose Paul's studio, um, which, which is, um, what's it called, Hog Hill, which is a converted windmill, because George does have a functioning studio in Friar Park as well. He's got uh, he, he, FP he, shot. FP shot. He, 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 he does. And again, you, you get the sense this is part of the compromise. Well, if you're getting the producer, I'll get the engineer in the studio. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's it's a trade-off. And so the recording proceeds for February uh, 1994 and February 11th seems to be the first day of recording. And that kind of makes the whole thing look a bit more of a lie, the whole story of January that, you know, Jeff Lynne suddenly rocks up on the 11th of February, a few weeks after the cassettes have been handed over. This is it, obviously something that's been in process it, for a while. It's it's really hard to credit that that they just you know Paul got off the plane, and drives straight to Jeff's house, gives <laughs> gives him the cassettes, and Jeff spends a week beavering away, cleaning up the tapes and getting clicks and hums off it. I mean that that doesn't that doesn't kind of stack up. And then and two or three weeks later they're in a studio recording. Yeah, just ready to go. Yeah. And uh, it, it free as a bird is the one that gets uh, br- uh, you know a- attacked first. And uh, it's interesting, you know, Jeff has spoken in his Mr. Blue Sky documentary and Paul does a great interview on that as well about the whole process and how, you know, it had to be sped up and slowed down. And there's a lot about this. There's a, there's a lot about anthology generally that speaks to it's right on the cusp of the internet world, the anthology yes. project. It's one of yes. the reasons why the timing of it is so good because we are pre- YouTube were pre file sharing. You know, if Jeff was working on this, you know, nowadays you wouldn't think twice about digitally sending it across to Jeff's house in LA and then firing it back. Yeah, and yeah. you know, we're we're currently working in a time where, you know, bands are making albums from different locations in the world due to lockdowns of various kinds. But all of this, you know, the whole Beatles anthology project is kind of the last gasp of uh, that kind of pre-internet world. It, it, yes. And the other, the, the other aspect of that is these days you would probably be aware of precisely what was happening because yeah. Peter would be, someone would be, you know, George would be using his Instagram account uh, <laughs> to, uh, to, 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 to put it up or, or Ringo would be tweeting pictures uh, of what was happening in the studio. So I, I remember at the time knowing vaguely that the project was happening. Yes. But, um, but maybe my, my sort of uh, tuning into the Beatles was, was not fully functioning at the time. I was moving on to other things. or But I, I wasn't, you know, you couldn't follow this in real time. You yeah. were getting little snippets of information or something would appear in the music press that they'd been seen together or something was happening. But it wasn't, I, I remember being shocked suddenly seeing on the front pages of the Sunday supplements pictures of three of them together yeah. once we get towards the end of the project. And that's when it really started to impact. Yeah. Um, All the stuff that Jeff says he had to do with the free as a bird tape, which was, you know, that the, the timing was all over the place and there was kind of some tonal issues. You, you could fix those things on your phone now at the click of a yeah. button. You quantize, yeah. you auto tune, you do all that kind of stuff. So, but Jeff, you know, the, 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 again, it's more of this kind of legend building. You know, Jeff was chosen because he was the guy with the technical know-how. It wasn't just because he was George's mate. And then poor George Martin, you know, there's like a, you know, another yeah. legend made up about him being kicked well, uh, from inside. Yes. So again, this is Paul uh, putting out the official word is that uh, George Martin didn't want to do this because his hearing was going. And uh, he said, you know, he's a sensible guy. And he said, look, Paul, I like to do a proper job. And if I can't, my hearing's not up to it. I'll just take a back seat. Um, but that, again, that doesn't have the ring of truth either because, you know, he is involved in producing the music uh, from the vaults and, and splicing together those various yeah. takes. Uh, he goes on to work on other projects. He, he works with Giles on, on the Love album in, in yep. uh, uh, 2006. So, again, this is clearly the cover story for George Harrison putting his foot down and saying, this has got to be Jeff. And so there's a couple of scattered days of work on Free as a Bird. And it seems that 94 is mainly Free as a Bird initially yeah. that, uh, you know, we're not really sure how many days exactly there are, but it's in February and maybe into March 94 is the first run of uh, yes. recording sessions yes. on that. And it's all in Paul's uh, Sussex Hog Hill uh, recording studio. And it's interesting. I mean, you know, this... I remember at the time it's kind of been told us, can you believe it that, you know, they've taken this tape of John Lennon and they've yeah. recorded three guys on it. And I'm like, well, that's kind of been happening forever. It happened 
Buddy Holly after he died, you know? Yeah, Jimi uh, Hendrix in, yeah. the, in the 70s, people embellishing tapes. Absolutely. Yeah. And even at the time, you know, I remember in, you know, in the early 90s, there was a Thin Lizzy song, Dedication, that came out where they got the members of Thin Lizzy to play over a Phil Linnet demo or, or backing tape. And even when Anthology came out, they were fighting with Queen, uh, who were putting out their Made in Heaven Freddie Mercury album, which yes. was made up from the same kind of tapes. The, the other thing that I wasn't aware of until the Elton John autobiography came out, um, he has a, a little section in there where Yo he says Yoko approached him with John's demos oh. uh, and said, you know, could you finish these? And he 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 said no. You know, <laughs> he, he didn't want to do it. He felt it was uh, sort of either inappropriate or he didn't he didn't want to do it. And he, he sort of thinks, oh well Yoko was maybe a bit offended by this. So that that seems to predate yeah. Um, um, but the idea is is not a new idea. Yeah. And so there are other songs. We said there's four demos that was handed over uh, to Paul in January. Wink, yes. wink. Yeah. And uh, the next recording sessions, we kind of get into uh, June uh, 94. And we think they work on now and then at that point. Is that right? Yes. So this is this is the, the, the sort of the story where, where you start to get a little bit of animosity coming through. So in, uh, supposedly in June the 22nd, they're back in Paul's studio. They're working on uh, Now and Then. That does not go well. George is not happy. Uh, he's not a big fan of the song. Mm. Um, it, uh, Jeff Lynn has talked about there being more technical difficulties to overcome with that particular tape. So that's that session breaks down. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because, uh, you know, there, there, there's a couple of people who've, you know, the Now and Then song is out there. You can hear it if you want. You can hear John's demo. Yeah. There's a couple of enterprising people online who have kind of mocked up what it might sound like in a sort of Threetles uh, version. But in the in the Jeff Lynne documentary, Paul's kind of, again, jokingly PR mode, I might nip in and finish it someday with Jeff, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, but yeah. I, my feeling is that he's, you know, he also says in the documentary that George... I think he uses another expletive, you know, it's crap or something. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, well, and it's well, quite blunt that it's all George's fault that we don't have a third Threetle yes. song. Yes, I mean, what, what, what he says is that George says, uh, you know, he didn't like the song and that John had, quote, unquote, gone a bit off uh, <laughs> with his songwriting towards the end. And, you know, Paul is saying, you know, that's, that's a bit, presumptuous you I, have know, to admit, uh, yeah, I have to admit like the, the, the absence of a third song from the three of them it just speaks volumes that they just yes, couldn't they just get couldn't it together go, it, no. it, 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 it just breaks your heart that oh well we, you know we got the two songs but we, you know there should have been a third and yeah. uh, it, 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 it just think you know it's, it's just sad I, but, I think the, the, only, the only comment I've ever heard from Ringo is well it would have been another John song and yeah. the Beatles weren't all just John songs. So. Well, I think that's reasonable because, you know, Free as a Bird compared to Real Love, you know, Free as a Bird has the gaps. And it, it actually, you know, it, it's an impossible task to try and do what Free as a Bird was trying to do, which is yeah. to, you know, be the greatest song of all time and to matter to you as much as Hey Jude. Yeah. Um, but it had gaps where they could all take a verse and they could all sing in a way. And, you know, it's, it's, it's again, you know, the, the, I love Free as a Bird, but I can appreciate that it's kind of put together by committee in some ways. George sings a verse, Paul it, sings a verse, it's, Paul it, gets a certain type of solo, you know. That, that's it, not how they did things back in the day. So that session then breaks down, that uh, you know, attempt at now and then. And it's it seems that there's almost a by way of a compromise apology that the next day they get together in George's house. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, certainly Pete, Pete Doggart uh, uh, construes it in that way that this is George making an apology for having walked out or caused the session to break down the day before. And this is uh, June the 23rd, 1994 and they go to Fire Park and this is my favourite thing because this is the footage that we have in Anthology of the three of them knocking around George's house. Yes. And so I wonder although it was, although Doggett says it's an apology, they did have a film crew there so the, uh, there must have been something planned or was there a film crew recording now and then? I I wonder. I don't I, know. I, I I think they're probably a film crew, yeah. permanently, permanently, you know, circling, circling them. Yeah, you do see in the in the real love video that they've got video cameras. 
Yes. I would love to get that footage. Ringo in particular seems to be fond of the old video eight video camera. Well, he's he's the photographer in the band. He you is. know, he, he he's he's always recording, taking snaps and things. But so, what must uh, be on those tapes? My goodness, I'd love to see all of that. But yeah, the twenty third of June is so um and a lot of it features as DVD extras as well on the DVD um yeah. of the 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 the, the eventual release of anthology and it's fascinating the it's, moments in it, anthology where the three of them are together is just you can cut the i i feel you can cut the tension even though there's nothing actually objectively tense happening but it just doesn't feel natural no no because the, they're all they're all playing a part and i mean i would say this wouldn't i but paul is playing the part you know paul is being paul yeah um, and you can see this, this, this like this is totally normal. <laughs> this is yeah. This is just you know. Um, I mean, there's there's a there's a scene earlier where where they ri- arrive. They're arriving at his studio, and George gets out of this amazing car. Yeah, and that's um, not on the DVD, but that no. is yeah, it's on YouTube. And YouTube and Paul is going, oh, lovely motor, lovely <laughs> motor, and and you can just you can just feel even as George has his back to the camera, the sort of disdain for this is, and he's probably thinking this is a multi million pound. It, it's you some know, kind of road. fancy McLaren. I think it's a one of a yeah. kind McLaren that they get yeah. out of, and it's hugely ostentatious. And it's a really funny clip because but it's just, Paul you know, obviously is just one of these people who couldn't care less about what kind no. of car it is. Just does no. not care at all. But no. is trying to say, "Oh, it's a lovely motor," <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and yet we're all wondering why George is bankrupt. You know, yes. it's just, well, it's just you know, the the the, the mind boggles. It's but, an inv- it was an investment. <laughs> it was an investment. Uh, but the, the 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 footage that I remember is there is it is when they're all sitting around playing the ukuleles and singing "Ain't She Sweet." Yeah. Um, it's phenomenally they're phenomenally fast it's amazing how they slip into obviously they're professional musicians but yeah they do harmonize and we've got the footage of them you know uh, playing blue moon of kentucky and a few of those things as thinking well of link, thinking of linking yeah and you know they they do kind of slip into that um but, i do again, yeah. again, you, you you see paul you know it, they do thinking of linking and they do raunchy yeah um, and then Paul says, you know, shall we do one more? And George is kind of getting off the stool. He's dead. You know, we, can we do one more? Can we do more? Yeah. Blue Moon of Kentucky. And George is going a short version. Yeah, you know, and it's, <laughs> it, it's like the day the day is over. It's time to go. But the, re- the, the reality is, you know, Paul also just loves music. He would happily sit there and play. You, you know the story about um, George Martin trying to leave a party. And Paul no? just, there's, there's this story, I forget where I heard it, but it's like Paul is at this party and he just keeps playing kind of songs and George Martin's like, yeah, I have to go. But Paul just likes <laughs> playing stuff on the piano and go, hey, no, what about this one? Do, but, do, do, do. And they, they just but, kind but, of... But that, that, that is the sense that you get that Paul does not want that day to end. Yeah. You know, this is this is his ultimate fantasy. He's sitting in with a guitar, with George. Ringo was behind the drum kit. And there it's just, they're doing what they did back in 58. 59, but they 16, do, yeah. but but I do think Paul wishes, you know, like you know, why, why, why is George so mean? <laughs> I, I, I I think it, it's it's terrible that Paul doesn't realise why that exists, why that atmosphere exists, and that why the relationships are the way they are. Yeah, but the, the the touching bit, and I think we've talked about it before, is right at the end of that clip is when, um, you know, they're saying, well, we had a great day here, and Bringo says. I really love hanging out with you guys. Yeah. And it's so disarming to Paul and George and Paul just kind of puts his hand on his shoulder and it's, oh, it's just... Because because they both love Ringo. They both love Ringo. Yeah, They yeah. both love Ringo. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And if that, that's, that's sometimes having a Ringo in your life is all you need. So it's that happens in June 94. And obviously in the background, this thing is being edited together and being put together. As far as we know, most of the other interviews and everything are done um, yeah. but we don't uh, we're kind of it's going to be the following year before we start looking at edits and all the rest um, but as 94 plays out uh, what's interesting is another Apple sanctioned EMI Beatles record hits the record stands another one of these kind of proof of concept of catalogue marketing yes. this time it is new and unreleased material and so on the 20th of November 94 exactly one year before Anthology Live at the BBC comes out yeah. and I remember this was a big deal 
this was a huge deal. This yeah. was a huge deal because this was, as you say, this was new material. This was unreleased material. And uh, it, it, the, the, these were not just BBC sessions that were songs that they appeared on albums. These were songs that you couldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. And it's, it's you know, live the BBC and, you know, there's a, there's a podcast episode in that on its own. Uh, but yeah, it's 52 tracks. It was a double CD, uh, came out at the end of November 94 in the UK, started December in the US. And it's the first way of trying to, you know, it's interesting that this was deemed to be worthy of a standalone release when they could have rolled some of this stuff into an anthology, uh, but yes. they actually kind of pushed to get it out a year before anthology, that it's its, its own thing. Yes. Now, the story, the story that I've heard is that Ringo was one of the prime movers behind this because somebody somebody stopped him and asked him, this is when he was still signing autographs, asked him to autograph a copy of a, a CD collection called The Beat, The Complete BBC Sessions that okay. came out on, on a bootleg label, Great Dane. This is a thing I would like. If anybody has it, would like to send it to me. I, I'd give it a good <laughs> home. This supposedly was a, 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 a rather sort of exquisitely put together box yeah. of every single session. And Ringo was asked to sign it. And um, he sort of thought, okay, well, that's what people are buying this stuff. And and that that's where the idea originated, that he was saying, look, people, you know, the, the Beatles are very conscious of other people making money yeah. off, off the back of things that they did. Um, so I think that was that that's the sort of origin yeah. Myth. Maybe it's a myth. Um, I think Live at the BBC is an essential purchase. There's 30 songs on there that you just can't get anywhere else, like unique yes. songs. And there's you know, the other 22 tracks on the album are versions of tracks that we know. But this is the first true new official unreleased Beatles material since 1977 when Live at the Hollywood Bowl came out. Yeah. So it, 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 and, it is a and, big deal. And it gets the number one in the it, UK, it number, three in, number three in America, yeah. uh, eight, eight million copies sold in the first year. So, And, and what you have to remember is the, these are largely mono recordings made from BBC studios for the radio broadcast decades before and it's a number one but it album. is worth pointing out uh you know that all of this stuff happens in sort of a pre-internet time you know when you think yeah. about it because you know the timing of this is perfect you know there's no uh you know that the, there's no other way to get this material apart from expensive cd bootlegs there's no youtube there's so all this stuff is is kind of new so 94 rolls into 1995 and um 1995 apple discloses a very large profit in its tax return in january 1995 million. Yeah, eight, 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 18, 18 and a half million. 18 and a half million so you know they they're, tidy 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 some they're doing okay <laughs> this is pre anthology they haven't done any um, anthology uh, notes yet. And then there's a load of uh, recording sessions uh, that kind of happen. So do we think the three thals happen first? Is it? Yes, I think I think it's in February they start uh, they, they start work or re dig out the real love tip. Yes. And uh, so there, there may or may not have been some work done the year before, but February 95 is kind of the core of the, the work on real love. And I think the footage from the video comes from February 95. If we're trying yeah. to, to guess based on facial hair and all the rest, they're definitely, you know, they're obviously miming to sections of, of real love um, in that. And so that's the start of February, but there's a couple of other scattered sessions that happen uh, in, in the springtime as well. But there's another interesting recording session that happens around that time as well. Yes. So this is, uh, again, at Paul's house where Yoko is visiting. So we've had all the different kind of combinations. We've had Paul and Yoko in New York and at the Dakota. And now we've got Paul and Yoko hanging out in Sussex at Hog Hill yeah. Studios, making a recording a, a song. And this is obviously a song that Paul's knocked off on his uh, lunch break, <laughs> is it? Yes. Well, this, this is this. I've never understood. There's so many questions. Um, <laughs> why is Yoko and Sean are visiting? Why? Why are Yoko and Sean visiting? Did I, I like to think she thought maybe she was going to be invited to contribute to Real Love or something? But, okay. You know, she, she, she's uh, Paul. Supposedly, Paul is just showing her around the studio and. Uh, he says, "Hey, we we should record a song." And uh, Yoko, before Paul can dig out the Blue frog, of Kentucky, or, or Blue <laughs> of Kentucky, she says, "You know, oh, I've got this catchy number. Uh, 
Hiroshima sky is always blue. Yeah. And uh, off they go. And so we think this is probably March 95, although some people think yep. it's January yep. 95. Yeah. And, uh, and Paul and Yoko and their respective families, Sean and Paul's kids and Linda, they record this song in Paul's studio and it comes out later in the year. And I, I'm sure Paul has an eye on optics posterity again yes. what it means you know not wanting to wanting to add to the sum of goodwill that's in this project i know we're kind of joking about it a lot in this episode but i, I you know he is doing the best he can yes i mean i'm very prepared to give uh, uh paul credit for this i mean i think this this seems to me to indicate that he is genuinely trying to build bridges you know we're, he's building on that very awkward hug uh, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, but this, this seems a very genuine uh, um, attempt to build a relationship um, with, yeah. with, Yo with Yoko and with Sean. Um, uh, you know, this, this, this is not known about at the time and it's much later in the year. It's sort of back in, it's in August before this actually leaks out. Um, and uh, the song, I don't know, you can, you can get a version of this. There's a short four minute version. There's the full seven minute version. They're both available on YouTube. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's clearly a Yoko track. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's nothing not wrong a, with that. Nothing wrong with that. It's not a Paul McCartney track. Um, and I think supposedly from what I read, I don't have a copy of this, but it got, it gets an official release. Um, so in 2011, uh, Yoko had a, a, an art exhibition mm -hmm. at the Hiroshima City Museum of Contemporary Arts. You could, if you went to the gift shop, uh, you could buy a hardback book and you got the CD. And um, I, I always thought this song was uh, just a st in studio improvisation. Right. But it does seem to be something that Yoko had in her mind and she said, oh, we could do this. And so she gets sole credit. Fair uh, enough. And all the royalties, which I imagine are substantial. Substantial royalties. <laughs> um, and the other thing that happens in March is uh, Baby It's You comes out as a single in the UK as uh, and, and goes top 10 from the, the, the BBC, live the BBC album. And I, I certainly remember being in London in, in March 1995 and seeing posters for that single yeah. everywhere, all over yeah. the tube. That was a really... Um, big push. Uh, and we also think there's more Threetle sessions than in March, possibly on, on Now and Then, possibly on this song that we may or may not exist, All for Love. What's, yes, what's the story is, of that? Well, this is, again, different different reports of, uh, of, of George and Paul writing a song together called uh, All for Love. Um, it doesn't sound very promising, I have to say. But, well, you uh, know there's a terrible song. Do you remember that terrible song, All for Love, by Sting, yeah. Brian Adams and Rod Stewart? Perhaps it's that one. <sighs> that song, that song. Anyway, go on. <laughs> but uh, so again, supposedly this just this this again this session just grinds on. It doesn't it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't come to anything. George is losing interest, and this is this is potentially, I suppose, going to be the third single. Um, you know, if now and then has been abandoned, then this is this is the only possible contender for a third single, and it just goes nowhere yeah yeah but one one day one day paul and jeff will... <laughs> or just jeff on his own or just jeff will finish it off yeah um yes there are there are truths that will come out someday i suppose um but what's happening as spring goes into summer 95 is that the anthology you know starts to get finalized but at the same time you know, when you when we look at this timeline uh, towards the end of ninety five, it's amazing how much is still left to be done. Uh, yes, I, I, like like uh, there, there's an awful lot that hasn't happened yet. Yes, I mean, if I were putting this project together, you know, whenever we do the eight hour documentary about our podcast, yes, we will have that finished <laughs> before I take it out to the market. We, and we say, record them years in advance and we whittle yeah, them down from yeah, an eight hour no, rough take. We, yes, we, we've got we've got all those there, but 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 in May they are sort of putting this out for auction effectively. They're, they're looking for bids. Uh, we've got this TV show. Uh, presumably people can see the, the sort of early drafts and, and, and rushes of this. Um, but there is still so much more to do because they want this out on the TV uh, by the end of the year. Yeah. And so the, the, there is a bidding war and in the UK, um, apparently, you know, they're looking for 6 million. ITV bid 5 million uh, to yeah. show it in the UK uh, and Channel 4 drop out at 4.5 million. So I, 
Yes, I remember being very disappointed that, you know, it was going to be an ITV. Uh, yeah, it felt like a BBC uh, it, thing. It felt like it should be a BBC thing. Yeah, but it was, on, it was on RTE, obviously, in, in, in Ireland, and it was on ABC in the in the US, and ABC announced that they have the rights uh, a few days later on the 10th of May. Uh, what's interesting is the title isn't given when it's announced. They just sort of say we have... Uh, you know, this Beatles yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, George at this stage still wants it to be called The Beatles by The Beatles. Yes. Uh, there's not, it's nothing much catchy about that. And again, if you think about anthology, it's not an anthology. No, it's, it's, it's really the, a terrible name. It's a terrible name. Yeah. And again, it's just another product of this compromise, this negotiation, this, this uh, you know, Cold War detente where they're working something out. Uh, it's not... Um, like the Beatles by the Beatles isn't the worst title in the world. I mean, the reality is The Long and Winding Road is a good title, you know, possibly. Well, is it you, would, a... you, would, you would say that. But <laughs> well, it, uh, but yeah. it's, it, it, it's such a loaded... Uh, one for for to, it's a Paul song. Yes, um, and you know almost effectively it it's like a solo song by yeah. Paul. Secondly, for Paul, presumably it's reclaiming that from Spectre and the orchestra and the choir. So there's a, there's a lot of politics around that name, and I mean they must he he must have known from day one it was never going to be called that. I'm trying to think: is there any other song title that would have pleased people? Long, uh, long, long. <laughs> well, yeah, it was long, long, long. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it, it gets announced in May. I certainly remember the single, um, like, uh, around this time at the start of the year, February, March, the announcement that a single was coming, a reunion single was recorded and that a reunion single is yeah. coming. Because um, I remember talking to people at college about it and them not being particularly interested, but me being very interested yeah. in the whole thing. Um, but we're into May 95 and the Beatles start to see the first rough cut. And I'm wondering, is this a version of the rough cut that has circulated on bootlegs in recent years? It must be. It, it, it must be. I mean, there, there, there is a very comprehensive uh, DVD bootleg set with a lot of extra footage. I have to say, I have not watched that in a number of years, but uh, it, it must be. So again, it seems to me that here there are shades of Magical Mystery Tour. So they, they're, they're watching this, they're each giving their input. So I don't know if it's being cut and recut to the extent of Magical Mystery Tour, but essentially, you know, the production team, the director is having to keep everyone happy. Yes. Um, you know, and supposedly Paul produces very detailed typed up notes yep. um, about what he wants. Um, at one stage, uh, Jeff Wanford, the director, said uh, George had wanted him to do the entire thing in the style of Monty Python. <laughs> Which I think would, I think would be excellent. Yeah. Um, well, it's it, it, you know May. The three of them are all together in May uh, ninety five, and they are um, they're looking at the rough cuts and it, that rough draft, that bootleg rough draft. The the credit sequence is one of the more most frightening things you'll ever see. It's this kind of head amalgamated yes. from their four faces that kind of yeah. splits into four. It's really terrible, and there's no incidental music, and uh, there's an awful lot of talk about drugs that gets eventually uh, whittled out and, and taken away. Um, but they, they also go to Abbey Road, the three of them, with George Martin. Yes. So this is this is late May, 22nd of May. Yeah. The three of them are there listening to various things. And at, and at one point, they got up, get up and go for a wander around the studio. Yeah, uh, around the around the building, just for old times' sake. And it's also this stuff is there, there's a film crew there. It's recorded for anthology. Memory serves. I don't think any of that footage goes into anthology. It goes into the DVD extras yes. of them yeah. hanging around. Um, you know, and they don't even. It's it's again. It's really weird. They don't remember what song is on what album. You're wondering no. is George kind of hamming that up a little bit? It's like, did you play bass on that? Well, yeah. I'm, if I'm playing piano, who's playing? Uh, yeah, and it's you know obviously they needed a they needed a Mark Lewis in the room for that. Yeah, but. Um, you know, it, they also apparently all go out for dinner with their 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 wives as well. There's a story from that time about somebody in a local cafe in Camden, I think it was, where Paul, George and Ringo wander in some <laughs> afternoon for coffee and sandwiches. And everyone's like, what? And again, it's a pre-internet thing. You know, that yeah. wouldn't happen now. Like no, when you think no. about how fast James Corden and Paul went around the world the day that happened. Uh, the fact that Paul, like Paul, George and Ringo walking into a cafe in 1995 is wonderful. 
a vegetarian cafe. Presumably. I would hope so. I, I would hope so. I mean, uh, yes, yeah, so you, you would have liked to have been sitting in that cafe. Uh, yes, yes, I would indeed. And so Bob Smeaton, the series director, you know, says, you know, recalls watching watching the rushes with George talking about the breakup and Paul saying, I didn't know you felt like that, George. Like, it's all very I, strange. I think that is the most telling. Yeah comment about the whole thing that they're watching that final episode uh you know that that end sequence uh 1969 1970 and paul is going i never knew that i didn't know this this annoy yeah and you think this is the point paul yeah uh you, you you know you need to engage with this and then you can work through it and then we can get out the other side. And there's a couple of quotes uh, you've pulled here from uh, Jeff Wan for the producer saying, it was an insane amount of hassle and pressure, the most nightmarish thing I've ever had to do in my life, a lot of mind games and a lot of my job was to stop them talking yeah. to each other to keep them happy and not telling one of them what the other one had said. Yes. Oh, so, this is, so, so then you have this notion that they are then finally together watching it and for the first time Yes, he hearing what they have each said about particular areas, and and particularly in that nineteen sixty nine nineteen seventy period, that must have been, you know, like sitting in, yeah, yes, just sitting in on someone else's therapy session. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, and in this notion of you know the thing not being named by the time it's announced in May, it's June nineteen ninety five when they pick up the phone to Klaus Vorman and say, I suppose we should get a cover for this thing. I find it amazing that. The graphic design or the organ, like that still hadn't yeah. been considered or thought out. I guess back in the 60s, everything was, you know, a few weeks from studio to you, shelves. But it just... You, you, you get a sense that they are still working that way, that, that, that it is just they're sort of flying by the seat of their pants slightly and... Uh, you know, it's the Beatles. Everything will be fine. Yeah. So Klaus Vorman is contacted in June 95 to do the cover. And, you know, that gets completed in September. He's given access to the photo archives. And we yeah. all know the anthology cover. It's this triptych of images where the three album covers, you can put them um, side by side. And I, I guess it it is good. It does sort of, it does represent the past and, and them as well. I, you know, it's it's a bit, um, it's a bit cheesy, but, you know, it's, it's, it's. I, I. You think cheesy? You think cheesy? Yeah, maybe cheesy isn't the word. It's not very I, dramatic. No, no. It's very, I, I, you know. It, it is, I mean, I, it is something I do like. I really did like the cover on the first anthology CD. When you can get out. lost in those covers. You, yes, because you're kind of trying to identify, uh, you know, would it have worked better if they'd just taken the actual photographs rather than have it painted? You, you know, it's, mm. it's all painted. That, that was the aspect I didn't like. But I did like the, the sort of collage effect. Um, and, yeah, and I think it has aged well. I don't think it's... Uh... I, I think so. And what, one of the things I, for years, I just assumed this was Klaus Vorman had done this from start to finish. Nobody didn't. Only, no, only comparatively recently that, that, that I learned that, uh, that he, he sort of designed it, sketched it out, and then someone else uh, uh, actually... Uh, Alphonse Kiefer. Yes. Uh, did the painting itself. Well known. Um, <laughs> well known. Alphonse. I've got a so, couple of Kiefer's up on my wall. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, he, he, he's, he's described as an ultra realistic uh, painter. Uh, so he actually did this. And there are two, you'll know this, there are. Well, I, 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 do you know what? I knew about one of them, uh, but the other one you told me about, I didn't know about. Yeah, so, so I these, knew these that... are two little kind of. Uh, Easter eggs, I guess. Easter eggs, uh, yeah. Um, so go ahead. You can. You well, can... I, know, I always knew that Klaus Vorman is hiding on the cover of uh, Anthology because Klaus Vorman is hiding on the cover of Revolver. Yes. And so if you look at the cover of Revolver where he's signed his name, his picture is in the montage. Yeah. And the bit of Revolver that's reproduced on the cover of Anthology uh, is the bit of the montage with him in it, but the picture is updated for him in the 90s. Yes. So I he's didn't. Eight... Yeah aged himself he has aged it? himself but it means that he is uh the only person not in the beatles to appear on two beatles album covers basically yes, yes. um and he's still uh, alive and with us but what i didn't realize was that alphonse Kiefer is on the cover yes so um, where is should we tell people where he's hiding well I, he he is high will we ge generically tell him he is hiding in the cover of sergeant pepper yes so the painting of the Sgt. Pepper cover has been altered. And one of the original faces there, one of the original characters has 
disappeared and been replaced. So we'll just let people tweet or uh, have a little look and see where he's there. On, let us let us know on Facebook. And speaking and, of characters uh, being replaced, uh, poor Pete Best, eh? Yeah, poor Pete, poor Pete. Poor this is, Pete. again, uh, you know, there's always just something not quite peace and love about each Beatles project. And yeah. this is, I think, poor Pete Best. Um, so Pete Best is kind of ripped from his picture on the cover of Anthology One. So things are all last minute. That picture, that painting, that cover isn't finished until September 95. And in September 95, everything starts to come together. And one thing that happens in September 95, a little side avenue, which I might talk about, is the Help album. Not the Beatles Help album, but an album yep. called Help by War Child. And this is an interesting album. And it's a good signifier of what was happening culturally at the time because Britpop was insanely popular. And, um, you know, you know, we could have a whole podcast series on the history of Britpop. You know, did it start with Suede's debut single? I'd like to think so. I but think so. <laughs> in 1995, um, this concept of Britpop, and certainly in, in the UK and Ireland, uh, was huge. And in August 1995, you know, the, the sort of what's often reported as the pinnacle was the Oasis versus Blur battle for, for number one. But on the 4th of September 95, uh, a charity album was recorded called Help uh, for the charity War Child and it was put together by Andy McDonald from Go Records and it was inspired by John Lennon's Instant Karma um, because John Lennon said he wanted records to be like newspapers and they should be recorded in a day and put out the next day and you know that's, that's how you do it. So he had this idea the previous weekend that uh, we should record an album in a day and he got all the, the big wigs of, of Britpop uh, to appear and turn up onto this album. So you have you know people like Suede and the KLF got back together and um, you know Stone Roses are on it and Manic Street Preachers and that's the first appearance of the song Lucky by Radiohead is on this album before it goes off to be on OK Computer. But the main thing that happens is a supergroup goes to Abbey Road to record Come Together. And who turns up? Paul. Paul turns up. So this is a group, the Smoke and Mojo Filters, which is Paul Weller, Noel Gallagher, uh, Steve Craddock, Steve White, Carly Anderson, and Paul McCartney turns up and they record and it's filmed uh, a cover of Come Together. And this album is recorded on the 4th of September 95 and it's put out on the 9th of September 95. So, you know, part of the Beatles anthology story says that, you know, it happened at a time when the Beatles stock was high with the contemporary bands of the time. And I would certainly say on this side of the Atlantic, yeah. that was very true. Oasis were putting out their second album uh, in the autumn of 95. What's the story? Morning Glory, which was an immensely uh, successful huge album. album yeah, you know? huge album. Huge and, album. And uh, they were putting out the single Wonderwall, which is based on a George Harrison uh, soundtrack. Hugely successful song. Uh, you know, this was peak Britpop, peak Beatles cool. So yeah. for the anthology to be coming in on a wave of that and for Paul to sort of come in as this elder statesman, I recently looked up the ages they were at the time, <laughs> you know, I think, uh, you know, Paul is what, only 53 at the time of that uh, recording? A young man. A young man. And I think Weller's in his 60s now. But you know, that was a nice, it's a, it's a nice symbolic thing, but it, it just goes to show that, you know, there, there's a version of Paul that gets on with other musicians and that turns up and does the job. But, you know, when it's back to being the Threetles, it's a whole different thing. It's, yes. And again, it, you know, he's got to have had in his mind, we've got this project. Yeah. You know, Paul, whatever else, he's good at the PR. He's got a very keen commercial sense. Um, you know, George and Ringo are not interested in modern music no. at all. George famously has a spat with uh, Liam, Liam Gallagher, Gallagher yeah. you know, says, oh, yeah, the, you know, I quite like the guitar player, but I don't like the singer, you know, the stupid one. <laughs> um, so, you know, jo George has uh, no interest in modern music and certainly no interest in playing the role of elder statesman. Yes. Um, but that week of September 95, in the middle of that, there's the, the MPL uh, Buddy Holly party. And we know because Mark Lewison, name drop, said it on yes. our episode <laughs> that he was involved in the anthology project. And he remembers being at that party and Paul was kind of quite shook at the politics and what was going on. Yes, but Mark described uh, being at being at the Buddy Holly party that Paul um, at that stage held every year. Um, Paul had just come, I think, from that session the day before from from watching the rushes, and uh, I, I'm wondering is that maybe where that Bob Smeaton 
comment comes from about you know i didn't know you felt that way yeah um and he's clearly very upset or very emotionally charged as a result of that and and he's holding forth to the production team and mark lewis and happens to be there at the time so um clearly this is some kind of uh cathartic um point for yes. Paul in, in all of this. And, uh, you know, people can go back and listen to the Lewis and episode. Now, yeah, where he talks there. about that. He, it's very, very illuminating. But then it becomes real. The 11th of September 1995 is when the official press release comes out. Just when you thought you'd heard it all, Capitol Records releases, announces the Beatles Anthology 1 track listing. And uh, so this is kind of, a, I think the initial announcement is on the 11th of September. And I think the track listing comes out in full in October. Yeah. Uh, um, for for what's coming out, and this thing now finally has a name. The free as a bird has a date. Yeah, and I remember 1995. Me was getting more excited as the weeks go by. That for the first time in my life, I would experience a a, a new a single, brand new, a new Beatles song. single. Yeah. Um, but it becomes real, and this is where the kind of the 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 publicity machine kind of starts to kick into overdrive. Yes, this is this is this is where the pace starts to pick up, yeah. and there is there is a there is a sense of a, a, a sort of a, a a rush towards the finishing line. Yes, and uh, one of the things, and this is really one of the first things that I recall, uh, is this photograph appearing of the three Beatles. Um, yeah. Now I don't remember and, this at the time, but this was in on the fifth October ninety five. This is on the cover of the Sun. Yeah. And this was kind of a stolen photo or a sneaky photo? This was just an unofficial snap uh, that the Apple staff photographer took. And then he he sold it to the Sun for £100,000. And I think the headline was like, got back or something like that. Yeah. And it's yeah. the three of them in a sneaky photo, but it is the three of them. Yeah. Um, the official photographer, though, was... Linda. For Linda. Linda got... And she got a paid a retainer or got paid per image yes. for the, yes. the official... She, she, yeah, she got £2,000 per photograph. It's good work if you can get it. Yeah, she must have known someone. So the thing is, if you look at any of the official photos of Paul, George, and Ringo from '95, Ringo took or Linda took them. You have to pay her two thousand pounds. I have to pay. If I look at them, I have to pay her two grand. But the, the 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 photograph that I remember, and it was on the front cover of a Sunday paper supplement. Yes, it is the three of them standing under a tree, and there's a white peacock. Oh yes, yes. Walks into the shot. Yes, and and that allowed Paul to sort of say, "Oh, that was John was there." <laughs> yes, <laughs> he's he's so good at that kind of thing, isn't he? Yeah, he's just so yeah. good. He's he's natural. <laughs> um, and so then we kind of ratchet towards the the final date itself. My own personal recollection the first time was the cover of Q magazine, yes. which had the three of them together. And I remember walking into a shop and that, seeing that cover again pre internet times. You'd know the way of seeing it. Uh, and I still have it on my shelves inside, you know, calm down, calm down. And it's, it was a brilliant cover. Yeah. Uh, absolutely fantastic article, really exciting and expansive. Mojo then came out with a set of covers, no contemporary pictures, but a very deep, one of the best in-depth looks at the anthology. If you can find a 95 yeah. copy of the, the, the Beatles anthology edition of Mojo, absolutely fantastic. So this becomes a real thing. And eventually... The you know alongside all this, there's there's the work on the free as a bird video. Yes, and again, this this is the point that you were saying. We're very late in the day. Yeah. So uh, according to to the research that we've done, twenty third of October, uh, they start making uh, that video. They, yeah. they, they start making they start making the video, and it's a guy called Joe. Pitka, mm -hmm. who's an American film commercial director, uh, had worked with Michael Jackson on Heal the World. There's going to be some irony there that he was Michael Jackson's. Uh, but anyway. Um, well, you know, Michael Jackson kept free as a bird off number one. Yes. Uh, that, 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 that annoys me. And I know there's more important things in the world that should annoy me. <laughs> that annoys me. Uh, you think if you're annoyed, do you think how Paul felt? Uh, Paul must have been very annoyed. But the, the, the mistake was, and we're going slightly off piste here, was releasing the single after the album. They should have done what they always did in the 60s and put it out as a standalone single. Or, or just put it out beforehand, give it at least a week's head start. But why put it on the album? It, it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. I mean, uh, you yeah. know, I, 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 I was I bought the first ever copy of Anthology One uh, sold in Northern Ireland. That's my claim to fame. Very good. <laughs> I, remember I remember standing in our price um, watching them unbox it 
uh, <laughs> I, I took the, I took a day off work just to listen to it. And it was a little disappointing. Well, I uh, I remember being in a lecture on the day it came out and uh, one of my lecturers saying, there's a new Beatles song and album out today and really you should all go off and get it. And I remember thinking, he's a good lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> I like him. But, but you know, but, but, but Free as a Bird it should have been, I think it should have been a standalone single because that's the way they did things in the 60s and it, it doesn't fit. It's it's a modern recording sort of shoehorned into a, a, an archive piece. Yeah, well, it, it, uh, what was impressive at the time is how locked down it was and how it didn't get heard until the embargo lifted. Now, George apparently played it early to Damon Hill, his yes, racing because- buddy. Because again, if you have an absolute strict embargo and this big important project, and no, then George is going to break that embargo. Basically, you just don't tell George what to do. That's uh, you really have that sense that that's the case. You know, he's, he's you know, if if. We look at that that idea that uh, you know he wanted this to be like Monty Python. There is this kind of irreverence about it. <laughs> yes. uh, there is this idea. Well, if you tell me how to do something, I'll 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 do it the different way. Uh, Jeff but- Wanfer says specifically, George is the one that opened up about everything, and that did not play well, particularly with Yoko. So you you get the sense he must have started unpacking all that baggage. Yes. With his, his relationship with John. But again, leaving stuff to the last minute, there are still some bits and pieces of outstanding EMI Apple litigation. And so it's still into November at the 11th hour that there's stuff being signed off on yep. the week before the music comes out. So they're obviously yes. printing it. It's obviously at the presses and in the trucks on the way to the stores. Yeah, this, uh, this is how lawyers work. You leave everything to the last <laughs> minute and, uh, and and then sign everything on the back of an envelope. It's, well, uh, yes. Well, it's, it's it's memories of them signing at the last minute before Abbey Road comes out in, in September yeah. 69. And I think EMI were thinking that it would be the first of a suite of things like Esher demos and Let It Be and all the rest, which were still sort of parsing out 25 it, years later. Yes. So, I mean, if you think about it, they they, they had the Red, the Blue album, they'd had uh, uh, the BBC, there was still more BBC stuff in the vaults. Yep. Uh, they were looking down the road to the Esher demos. Let It Be has been talked about, uh, you know, as being on the cusp of release. Yep. Uh, every few years, that was a rumour that was coming out. So, uh, EMI were really staking everything on Apple. Yes. Uh, you know, pulling out these big money spinning projects. And it's only on the 18th of November that Neil Aspinall and Derek Taylor sign off on the Free as a Bird video, which That's is crazy. hilarious. And <sighs> the song finally gets its debut airing on BBC Radio 1 at 4.07am on the 20th of November. That's when they play Free as a Bird. And I think it was that early because it was happening in the, in, in the States. Yeah, uh, I, I, did, I, did not, I did not set up or get up. Well, I remember uh, there was a TV special on that night where people yes. reminisced about on ITV for half an hour about how they love the Beatles and it was Cilla, Cilla, Cilla Black and the like all the like all, and, the, big, all the big stars and Jimmy Starbuck it was it was it was the, 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 the trail was at the end of this half hour we will show you the new video so that's when I first saw yes, it me too and heard it and I remember watching it going I like it I think what was that what's happened I mean yeah. you know there's there's always anticipation. Uh, I, I always knew that there would come a point where I would hear it and then I'd the time would pass and there's nothing you can do about that. It's like yeah. many good things in life. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, on the 20th of November, there's a press conference and I think, did they expect the Beatles to turn up? I think, I mean, there seems genuinely to have been this naive expectation that the, the three of them would be there. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, which again, it, it, it perhaps says more about the media and, what people wanted it to be. Yes. You know, I mean, as, as someone that, that had lived through the 70s and, and, and that the reunion rumours and then 1980, et cetera, et cetera, I, I genuinely just always believed that if they got back together again, everything would be all right. Yes. Everything would, the sun would come out, uh, everything would be fine. And I think there was clearly that anticipation, that element of, of that, that they're going to turn up, they're going to be there. And it didn't follow the script. And who they did, the press, the people the press did meet were George Martin, Derek Taylor and Jeff Lynne. Well, Jeff was there. So, I mean, what what more did the press want? I mean, you know, it's like having all the Beatles in one person. And when Derek Taylor was asked, where are the Beatles? Derek says, 
everywhere else but here isn't how true is that and then the following Derek, uh, Derek, Taylor, Derek was a legend and then following that the 21st of November that is anthology day we get the TV show we get the the albums and uh, and all that stuff gets released yeah. but I think you're you're right you know there was this notion that well if we can just get them back together they'll realize they love each other as much as we love them and yeah. something new will bloom and that's not really the legacy or not what happened next no uh it is that sort of slight disappointment that you, you know you're anticipating something or you 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 and it's almost as if the world made slightly made a fool of itself and then woke up the next day and realized oh well perhaps that was a bit embarrassing that we got a bit worked <laughs> up about that so it it sort of it sort of fizzles out slightly i mean i yeah. remember you know we'll not talk about the content of the of the yeah. Uh, of the TV show, but it, you know, the audience numbers started to decline. It, it, the last episode in the UK was shown around Christmas time and it became a bit of a non event and then it just sort of fizzled out. And then in March 96, Anthology 2 comes out. There's a bit of interest around that. And Anthology 3, in, it comes out in October of 96. And it's, it's just, it ceased to be a news event. Yeah. There was all of this anticipation. Could never hope to live up to the hype, and I, I suppose in a way, that's what certainly what John and George. It's really what all of them had been saying all the way through the seventies. You know, yeah. it it it. We can't be what you want us to be. Yeah, you know, and so, you know, they always. Uh prided themselves on telling the truth, you could say, and yeah. they were right all along. But maybe the after effects and the tale of the anthology is what we're going to talk to next, because uh, we've said that there'd be a couple of these episodes scattered throughout 2020, the 25th anniversary of the anthology, the silver anniversary. So we're going to leave that to another day. You know, where did the anthology leave us once it had all, once the circus had left town, so to speak? Nicely done. Thank you very much. Um, so we hope, you've enjoyed, we hope you've enjoyed that. I mean, there's more to this anthology story than meets the eye. And it's it's amazing how prickly and difficult it is. And and congratulations to um, to the, the people who managed to get uh, Paul, George and Ringo to, to behave long enough to, to get it to air. I'm certainly glad that, that it exists. Uh, but we will talk about that another day. We remain available on all the usual places. Uh, we're on Twitter at Beatles Pod. We have a Facebook group. Uh, Stephen can let you in there. Um, we thank you for subscribing uh, wherever you subscribe. If you want to leave some nice reviews, uh, we're always appreciative of that. Um, but for the next time, until the next time, I'm Jason Carty. I'm Stephen Cockcroft. And this has been Nothing Is Real. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Nothing Is Real is powered by Acast. 